you know, those of you who've been following for a long time probably know this already, but it's worth repeating this and, and clarifying this. You know, Ayn Hirsi Ali, in my view, uh, is one of the real heroes of the post-9-11, of really the last uh, 20 years. Uh, she is unbelievably brave. She has a phenomenal life story. I'll highlight that a little bit in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, she has... Uh, uh, she has stood up against Islamism um, in, in the face of uh, death threats, in the face of people she knew well being murdered, uh, and she stood up against them and, uh, and challenged them. Uh, she is a keen observer of the Islamic world, but, but more importantly, a real valuer when it comes to Western civilization. Just, what was it, a week ago, two weeks ago, when I was at the Jordan Peterson conference, I mentioned that I thought she gave, uh, she was one of the best people up on stage. Uh, she gets the West, and she is unequivocally a, a great hero, a hero because she has the right ideas uh, for the most part. We'll get to where she doesn't, but she has the right ideas for the most part. She, she, she articulates them. She speaks them. She's incredibly articulate and intelligent. And she does so in the face of real obstacles, threats to her life. And she has achieved what she has achieved in spite of the fact that this is a woman who grew up under an Islamist regime with an Islamist family being taught at a Muslim Brotherhood school, taught is the wrong term, I mean, brainwashed in a Islamic Muslim Brotherhood schools brainwashed to hate life, brainwashed to hate Jews, brainwashed to hate, to sacrifice all for Allah, to live by religious dogma exclusively. So uh, here's a woman that has stood up to religion, uh, managed as a teenager to escape somehow establish herself uh, in the West, became uh, a known atheist and a known uh, opponent of radical Islam. She was a, uh, a member of the parliament in the Netherlands as a young woman, just a few years away from being a refugee and just a few years away from being an Islamist in the post-9-11 period, she saw her friend and, and, and a, a collaborator, um, Van Gogh, the, the film uh, producer, uh, the film director, murdered in the streets of Amsterdam. And when the state of the Netherlands wouldn't, act, wouldn't grant her security, wouldn't provide for her security, she fled the Netherlands. I remember that. I remember already admiring her back when she was in the Netherlands, and then she you know, seeing her manage to escape to the United States or get to the United States and be embraced by a community of intellectuals in the United States and find a home here. And again, she continued in the United States to be a clear, passionate advocate, not only for the evils of Islam and Islamism, but also for the values, at least some of the values, primarily the value of free speech, in the West, when she was unbending. She was unbending. And, uh, you know, I was a fan. Uh, and uh, I met her, I managed, I, I met her once, uh, we talked. Uh, I can't remember when this was. It was, a, I think it was in a Mont Pelerin Society meeting years ago. Um, Ayn Hirsi Ali has read Ayn Rand. She told me at the time she had read Ayn Rand. But she was not attracted to the ideas of Ayn Rand. She was attracted to the ideas of David Hume, of kind of the Scottish Enlightenment. She was attracted to the idea, ideas of Bertrand Russell. And what attracted in particular to David Hume was skepticism. What Ayn Hirsi Ali embraced was, in spite of her principled defense of 
Western moral values, what ultimately stuck with her, what ultimately she embraced as a guiding philosophy in this new secular world that she adopted uh, was skepticism. And you can understand it to some extent. I mean, what appealed to her about, I think, the, the, the writings of the new atheists was the skepticism of religion. Um, and, and she embraced that skepticism of religion, and she associated anything absolutist, an absolutist view of the world, absolutist moral code, an absolutist view as religious. So while she was an absolutist on certain issues, it only went so deep. Uh, in spite of that, you know, at this latest conference, she was on a panel and she talked about the difference between the West and the rest of the world is the West is focused on life. You know, she, she, she was incredibly, incredibly dignified and incredibly brave and incredibly sharp and true in a way that people like Jordan Peterson and others just aren't the wishy-washy, ambiguous, you know, mumbo-jumbo kind of stuff. She is clear. She also, I think, important to understand what is going on. She also um, uh, married uh, Neil Ferguson, the British scholar, the historian, um, conservative. So I have to admit that when yesterday she posted, uh, she posted on Twitter, that's why I saw it anyway, X, she posted a, uh, a, a, a um, an essay, basically declaring herself no longer an atheist, basically declaring she, that she had now embraced Christianity. Uh, to me, this was a, a, a major blow. It was unbelievably sad, unbelievably disappointing, but also I think a further indication of the fact that the secular world is failing. It is failing all around us. Maybe one more step towards Lena Peikoff's predictions in DIM. But personally, it's just a failure, a failure of all of us who advocate for secular values. Now, I don't really think that because I'm not sure you could have actually gotten to her. But the point is, it's, it's a failure. And more than that, it is sad. It is truly sad that a person who came so far is willing to go backwards. Of course, not to where she came from, thank God. But backwards still. to fundamentally a rejection of reason in the name of faith. So I want to go over what she says her reasons are, because I think these, needs to be, these need to be taken seriously. I think she is one in a long line of intellectuals and commentators out there that are following this path. We, we, we all know what happened to Dave Rubin. And, and look, I, you know, I like Dave Rubin. We're, we're, we're really friendly and everything. But Ian is just, is just you know, Ian Hirsi Ali is, is, you know, she is a major figure. She is a, and, 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 you know, and she's a major figure uh, as an intellectual. Um, she's a, a real thinker and a real intellectual force out there. Dave is great, but it's just not the same. Dave, I'd say, I'm not surprised. I and Hissi Ali, I am surprised. But it's more than just even them. I, I mean, you saw, I, we did a show here a few weeks ago on uh, Kissin, uh, the guy from uh, Trigonometry, who published an essay about the problems with atheists. And, and, and uh, you know, he, he, he suggested that he was turning towards religion, even though 
not not Christianity in, in, in any sense or not anything uh, more substantial than that. Uh, so I think this is a real trend. It's a trend that in many respects, you can see um, uh, Jordan Peterson, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ushering, uh, Jordan Peterson creating the, 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 the culture for, the arguments for. And you can see here Jordan Peterson's influence on the culture more broadly. So, um, so I want to go through her arguments and, uh, and discuss them and, uh, uh, you know, see, um, you know, see, uh, you know, whether they make any sense or not. All right, I, I'm going to be back in one second. All right. So I've got a verse in front of me. I've taken out a few paragraphs that I'm going to read you. We're going to discuss them as we go along. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, and we can, we can see, we can discuss and debate uh, uh, kind of uh, the impact that they have had. This is in Who Woods. So I want, to, I want to cover this. I want to go over this and then kind of comment on it as we go along. So rather than watch a video, I'm just going to read you a segment from the essay. She published this essay on Unhood, um, uh, you, can, you can find it on Twitter, you can find it in a lot of different places. All right, she writes, uh, so first she writes about, uh, you know, her, her upbringing in Islam and, and the challenges we face from Islam, but broader than the challenges we face from Islam, she, she talks about the challenges the West faces from Russia, the challenges the West faces from uh, China. I mean, here is a, is a woman who understands that they are, there is evil in the world, uh, there are bad guys in the world, uh, that, uh, you know, these people want us, if you will, uh, dead, or they want us subjugated, whether it is the kind of uh, fascism of Putin, or whether it is the fascism of Xi, or whether it is the Islamo-fascism of Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, and the rest of them, the theocratic fascism of, of all of them. She understands that there is an enemy here. She understands the values that are at stake because she has been on that side. And again, she is intelligent. And she's saying that the, that the challenge right now in many respects is unprecedented. And I think she's right. Not only are we seeing, uh, uh, you, you know, the, the, what's going on in Israel, Hamas, and you're seeing this on university campuses. What you're seeing on university campuses, I don't know how many of you are following this, but it truly is unbelievably horrific, and, and it doesn't seem to stop, and they just get, they seem to be getting bolder and bolder. 300,000 people marched yesterday in London in support of Hamas. They won't say it that way, but that's what it means. The anti-Semitism is overt. It's no longer being hidden. Um, this is true uh, throughout the West, uh, throughout much of Western Europe, but particularly in the United States and in the UK. At the same time, we've got uh, Putin on the rise, or at least, uh, you know, uh, 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 trying to assert himself in Ukraine, engaged in, in uh, horrific actions in Ukraine, and where are the 300,000 people in support of the Ukrainian babies that were killed? Where are the 300,000 in the streets in support of Ukrainian sovereignty? None of that, right? So Putin gets a free ride to a large extent. The West is very tentative in its support. It talks a big game, but doesn't act. And indeed, Putin has no support for many of people I, 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 Lee, I think associates with on the right, has no support from people on the, le on, the, on, the, on the far left. I mean, Ukraine doesn't. Putin has their support. And then, of course, uh, the one place that everybody agrees is the enemy and everybody seems to hate uniformly, which is China. And yeah, the West faces the biggest set of challenges to its existence 
certainly since the fall of the Berlin Wall, but arguably since World War II, since uh, the rise of Nazism and the rise of communism, that period in the 20th century where it looked like collectivism was going to win and overwhelm the rest of the West. We now face challenges equal to that. And they're multiple, just like they were back then. And the question is, how do we survive these challenges? And for, for Ayn Hirsi Ali, this is a big issue. She understands, she understands what the West failure would mean for all of us, for all of us. And again, you can see that on October 7th in Israel. That's what the failure means. It means the barbarians control everything. It means the barbarians rape and pillage and destroy civilization. So here's what she writes, quote, we endeavor to fend off these threats with modern secular tools, military, economic, diplomatic, and technological efforts to defeat, bribe, persuade, appease, or surveil. And yet with every round of conflict, we find ourselves, lose, find ourselves losing ground. We're either running out of money with our national debt in the tens of trillions of dollars, or we are losing our lead in technological race with China. But we can't fight off these formidable forces unless we can answer the question, what is it that unites us? Now, I agree with all of that. She's absolutely right. Our defense, our defense of Western civilization is being weak, pathetic, appeasing, so far. We have compromised, we have sold out, we have bended the knee, we have given in. We have appeased over and over and over and over again. Yes, we have a big military we cannot use. And yes, our economies are in tatters. Not that anybody else's is better, but our economies are in tatters because we must appease every pressure group that exists out there. And I agree that to win, we must know what we are fighting for. To win, we have to have values. We have to know the value of what we're defending. And for that, there has to be meaning to the we. Who is we? What is Western civilization? What are we defending? What are we fighting for? We know who we're fighting. And yes, to some extent, we're fighting against barbarism, murder, rape, pillage. But what is the positive that unites us? What makes us all part of the same team? And what are the values, the positive values, not the negative values we're trying to avoid, but the positive values we're trying to achieve? And I agree completely that we have no such values explicitly articulated by the leadership of our culture. And this is where people like the new atheists, but also like people like Jordan Peterson and the other intellectuals left and right have failed us, failed us completely, thoroughly, deeply. What unites us? We have no clue. Skepticism. Skepticism. And by the way, what is the big difference between skepticism and relativism and moral subjectivism and ultimately woke and all its nonsense? Not much. Not much separates those concepts. She writes, the response that God is dead seems insufficient. This is in terms of what unites us. Absolutely. God is dead is empty. God is dead has no positive content. But it's upon us to provide that positive content. So she continues, so too does the attempt to find solace in, quote, the rule-based liberal international order. The only credible answer, I believe, lies in our desire to uphold the legacy of the judo 
Christian tradition. And this is, this is the great frustration. This is a complete misreading of our history. Is it a complete misunderstanding of the role of ideas in our history? It is a failure, a failure an intellectual failure, a moral failure. It is a failure to understand Western civilization and what it represents. It is a failure to see who your allies are, what we are fighting for, and what is truly, who is truly the enemy. It's a tragic failure. It's a failure I see everywhere. Every place I go, I discuss my, my, my talk at the University of Utah and how offended they were at the very thought of Western civilization. Never mind my interpretation of what it actually was. So it's true that the West has no answer to what it is that unites us. It is true that God is dead and the rule-based liberal international order are not good things to be fighting for. They're not concrete. They're not ideals. They're, they're not inspire. They do not move people. They, they have, they're intellectual, intellectual vacuous. They, they, they mean nothing. Mean nothing. They have no positive content. But what we need is a real understanding of Western civilization. What we need is a positive philosophy. What we need are positive values, not the old, trodden, irrational, undermining and undercutting values of a Judeo-Christian tradition that didn't lead to Western civilization. But Western civilization evolve from a rejection of those values, at least a rejection of significant number of those values, not enough of them, and that's our problem. That's our problem. Indeed, one of the reasons maybe that our military, economic, diplomatic is all geared towards appeasing and is all focused on weakness, maybe, 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 the reason for that is the Judeo-Christian, primarily Christian, view of morality, of altruism, of sacrifice, of suffering, which sadly so many of our secular friends have embraced. She goes on, quote, that legacy consists of an elaborate set of ideas and institutions designed to safeguard human life, freedom, and dignity. Really? Really? The church? was designed to safeguard human life, freedom, and dignity? Tell that to Galileo. Tell that to the Christian sects that were slaughtered. Tell that to all the people who died in the 30-year war between Catholics and Protestants. Dignity, there is dignity in bowing in front of the altar and placing the body of Christ in your mouth? There is freedom? Freedom? Where is there freedom in the Judeo-Christian tradition? What kind of freedom are we talking about? Political freedom? No. Not until the Enlightenment. Economic freedom? Nope. Tell that to the... To their, to their usurers who are slaughtered because they dare charge interest on money. What kind of freedom? Religious freedom? Whoa. What about all the pagans that were put to the sword because they refused to convert to Christianity? I mean, history, 101, simple. For 1,500 years, Christianity was a brutal, oppressive, anti-human religion dedicated to death and destruction. 
It was the Islamists today. Wab talks about the massacre in Verden, which is one famous example. Tens of thousands of pagans were slaughtered, but that's just one example. <laughs> Read the history of Christianity, what was done in Eastern Europe, in Northern Europe, in Scandinavia, all over the world. Northern Africa, what was done not just to pagans, but what was done to Christians who didn't quite agree on your particular version of Christianity? Freedom? Now, it is true that Christianity has been watered down. That Christianity has been secularized. That Christianity... now claims to uphold, claims to uphold human life, freedom, and dignity. But even then, look at the integralists, the national conservatives. Are they advocating for freedom? Dignity? Whose dignity? Human life? Some, but not all. And how was Christianity watered down? What was it watered down with? It didn't evolve. Christianity didn't evolve. It was watered down. It was watered down with reason. It was watered down with a respect for individual rights. It was watered down with enlightenment values and enlightenment thinking. It was watered down by the age of reason and the age of science. It was watered down by science. There's only so many times you can claim that the sun goes around the earth. At some point, you can't do that anymore. At some point, you have to acknowledge that the Bible is wrong because reality just is what it is. They didn't do that willingly. Kicking and screaming and objecting and slaughtering and killing and silencing all the way. The legacy of the Judeo-Christian tradition is not safeguarding human life. It is not freedom, and it is not dignity. There is no all men are created equal in Judaism. There is no freedom in Christianity. There is no individual dignity in Christianity. There is subservience. There is the bend to God. There is your commitment to sacrifice for the other, God, the group, whomever. That is not dignity. She writes, designed to safeguard human life, freedom, and dignity from the nation's state and the rule of law to the institutions of science, health, and learning. Really, I mean, the nation's state arose out of maybe the most secular, among the most secular periods in human history, the founding of America, and therefore, and, and later, the, the nationalist movements of Europe but not exactly driven and motivated by Christianity, even if they were Christian. The rule of law? Christianity, like all religions, is authoritarian. It is not the rule of law as we understand it, as the protection of individual rights. There are no individual rights, political rights, in Christianity, at least if they are, then for 1,500 years, they ignored them completely. And the institutions of science, health, and learning, this is the legacy of Christianity? There was no learning in Greece. There was no learning in Rome. But Greece is the prime example. We needed Christianity to do this? And... Institutions of science? Christianity did everything it could to subvert and undermine and undercut the institutions of science. Science became science, and the institutions of science became important in spite of, not because of. Now, she cites... She writes, as Tom Wood has shown in his marvelous book, Dominion, a book I just, I just bought and downloaded, so I want to read this book. 
Um, all sorts of apparently secular freedoms, she says, of the market, really, of conscious, conscience, and of the press find their roots in Christianity. The, the, the press? I mean, what was the extent, if you, if you read about this, uh, all the way to the 19th century, early, early part of the 19th century was the, was the church trying to suppress, for example, the writings of Spinoza, to exclude them, to ban them, and to persecute those who actually printed them and read them. Luckily, in Amsterdam, there was very little religion in that sense in, in the Netherlands, and they were the ones printing Spinoza and others like crazy. Where is this roots of a marketplace in Christianity? I mean, Islam has a more favorable view. Islam has a more favorable view of markets than Christianity does. Rich man to go to have, it's harder for the rich man to go to heaven than a, than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Just one of a gazillion examples within the Old Testament, uh, the New Testament that, have n that do not in any way support the idea that Christianity allowed markets to evolve. So she says, and so I came to realize that Russell, this is Bertrand Russell, and my atheist friends failed to see the wood for the trees. The wood is the civilization built in the Judeo-Christian tradition. It is the story of the West, warts and all. Russell's critique of those contradictions in Christian doctrine is serious, but it is also too narrow in scope. She fails to differentiate here between what evolved in the Enlightenment, the marginalization of Christianity, the watering down of Christianity, the great contributions of Spinoza on, the philosophers of that period, the thinkers of that period. She fails to see how even during the Renaissance, there was a systematic reappraisal of religion, a challenging of religious dogma, a watering down of religious ideas, and an embrace, an embrace of secular principles. Instead, it's just one progression. Christianity, this is just a logical consequence of the Judo-Christian tradition. It is not. It's the rejection of that progression. It is a revolution in thinking which the Enlightenment represents. So can we confront Islam? Can we confront Russia? Can we confront China? And if so, how? What unites us? Well, I've talked about this many times. What unites us is not atheism. What unites us is not some liberal order. What unites us, should unite us, not does unite us, but should unite us, are three ideas that came out of the Enlightenment, three ideas that they essential, essentially are Western civilization, three ideas that are necessary, necessary, maybe even sufficient, to fight Islamism, to fight Putin mystical Christianity, to fight China, and to fight our mystics at home, our Christians at home. Reason, individualism, and political liberty. In that order, because reason, everything flows from it. Reason, individualism, political liberty, those are the ideas that should unite us in the great civilizational struggle that we are facing. And to the extent that we reject them, as sadly Ayn Hirsi Ali just did, to the extent that the West says, no, 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 my faith is better than your faith. How do I know free speech is good? Well, because it's a tradition. It comes from the Judo-Christian tradition. That's what makes it good. And the Judo-Christian tradition is good. She continues to say, to me, this freedom of conscience and speech is perhaps the greatest benefit of Western civilization. There's a lot of truth to that. The greatest benefit, not the source, the benefit. It does not come naturally to man. It does not. 
It is the product of centuries of debate within Jewish and Christian communities. I want to scream. I want to yell. Out of frustration. It was these debates that advanced science and reason, diminished cruelty, suppressed superstition, and built institutions to order and protect life while guaranteeing freedom to as many people as possible. Unlike Islam, Christianity outgrew its dogmatic stage. It became increasingly clear that Christ's teaching implied not only a circumscribed role for religion as something separate from politics, it also implied compassion for the sinner and humility for the believer. No, Christianity didn't outgrow its dogmatic stage. Kicking and screaming and fighting all the way, Christianity was watered down by secular forces. It was watered down by science. It was watered down by philosophy, by ideas, by philosophers. Philosophers who were flawed, significantly flawed, but good enough to show us the weaknesses and the inconsistencies and the challenges that Christianity presented. And those philosophers didn't come out of Christianity. Yes, they, they, they study Christianity as everybody did. They were Christians as everybody was. But the whole point is they were challenging Christianity. It is so frustrating. It is not out of Jewish and Christian communities. Jews had very little to say about this kind of stuff, for example. And it wasn't Christian communities. It was, it was communities of uh, oppressed intellectuals who were at the fringes, who were not embraced by Christian communities. Take Spinoza. Right? <laughs> who was shunned by his own Jewish community. It was not embraced by Christianity, but was embraced by a modern, secular group of intellectuals in Northern Europe. And Christ's teaching? Who gets to decide what Christ's teaching actually imply? Who gets to decide which one of these what he says, what it means, how it means. Does Ein Hirsi Ali get to interpret it? The modern Christians do? Did which sect of Protestantism actually reflects this? Did the Catholic Church reflect it? Maybe, maybe uh, sixth century Christianity was the right Christianity according to Christ. How do we know? By what standard do we measure? How does she evaluate Western civilization as having any benefit? What makes freedom of conscience and speech important and crucial and so good, the greatest benefit of Western civilization, what makes it so? By the standard of Christianity, by the standard of God, by the standard of mystical revelation, by the standard of whom? We will not win. We will not win against woke we will not win against Putin or Xi or Islam by joining them in rejecting reason and embracing faith. We will not win by, if we don't understand our history, if we don't understand our intellectual roots and we don't understand the role of ideas in history. We will not win by shouting from the top of the mountain that our dogma is better than your dogma. This is a battle of ideas. Everybody we're opposed to, supposedly, that all the enemies we share with Ayn Hirsi Ali are all mystics. By joining them in becoming mystics, we do not win, we lose. And even if we win the specific exchange we lose in the long run because we become like them. I mean, the great failing of Christianity, but even greater, the great failing 
of secular philosophy, the great failure of Bertrand Russell, the great failure of Nietzsche, the great failure of the new atheists, is that they will not challenge Christian morality. They will not advocate for reason and individualism, maybe political freedom, but certainly not reason and individualism. That they will not advocate a reason-based philosophy and a reason-based morality. They will not stand for something really new and radical that is that is right there in the Enlightenment, if only they were willing to look and see, if only they were willing to let go of their Judeo-Christian traditional values. So this is, you know, she has fallen into the trap. You cannot fight the enemy without values. The only source of values is religion, and therefore we need religion in order to fight the enemy. The same trap Scott falls into, I guess. But this is all nonsense. And again, by doing so, you become the enemy. You become him. Now, there's no question there's some really good Christians. I'm sure Ayn Hirsi Ali will be one of the good ones. Her husband, now, now Ferguson, for the most part, is one of the good ones. There are a number of others. But there are also some really, really bad ones. And you know who the really, really bad ones are? They're the ones who are more consistent. They're the ones who take the Christianity more seriously. They're the ones who embrace the Christianity and really are going to fight for it. Who is going to win the battle for Christianity? Not the battle for Western civilization, but the battle for Christianity. Is it going to be the watered-down version or the principled version? I fear it is the principled one that wins in the end. So there's one reason I and Hussi Ali has turned Christian and has rejected atheism. Of course, atheism, just to, I mean, I think this is obvious to this group, atheism is nothing. Atheism is a negation. It is not a positive ideology. It doesn't stand for anything. It doesn't propose anything. It just says, God, as that concept that's conveyed by religion, is meaningless. There's no there there. It rejects faith. But it doesn't even elevate reason. You've got lots of people out there who call themselves atheists and who are believers in, I don't know, Mother Earth or the, or the original sin of man or a million other you know, mystical ideas. Western civilization is not atheism. It is not skepticism. Western civilization is not a rules-based liberal international order. It is not God is dead. Western civilization is reason, individualism, political freedom, and everything that that implies. That is worth fighting for. That we can defeat anybody on. But that's hard. That's hard to explain to people. And when you're surrounded by intellectuals as we are today who are all kind of religious, who kind of advocate for individualism, like Jordan Peterson says, oh, he's for individualism, and then a lot of his prescriptions are collectivist. He's for reason, but then his mumbo-jumbo is completely mystical. He's for political freedom, unless you disagree with him, and then maybe the state should regulate you. To be a true advocate of reason, individualism, and political freedom, political liberty, is a lonely job. It's a lonely job. I know, because <laughs> I'm one of the few who do it, and God is it lonely. The second reason she gives, so I've already gone 50 minutes, but this is going to be a long show today. Bear with me. We have 212 people watching. Let me just say 
please, if you're watching and, and if you're not a subscriber, please consider subscribing. Um, agree or disagree with me, I am going to challenge your beliefs and shake things up and cause some cognitive dif dissonance and get you thinking. So please, if you're not a subscriber already, please subscribe. Also, like the show before you leave if you can. We got 99 likes. That should be well over 200. So please like the show. It helps with the algorithms. All this stuff helps with the algorithms. So she writes, yet I would not be truthful if I attributed my embrace of Christianity solely to the realization that atheism is too weak and decisive, divisive a doctrine to fortify us against our menacing foes. I have also turned to Christianity because I, un, un, I ultimately found life without spiritual solace undurable, indeed very nearly self-destructive. Atheism failed to answer a simple question. What is the meaning and purpose of life? Here you get to the heart of it. And really, this is the source of the other. The lack of personal values. A need for purpose and meaning. And being educated by Muslims in her past, by, by the Jordan Petersons of the world today, the purpose and meaning can only be found outside of you. The purpose and meaning must be something elevated above you, more important than you. Every politician, left and right, cites this. Every intellectual out there explains this. Purpose and meaning are external. They're out there. They're to be found by searching. And atheists and Non-atheists all agree on this. I mean, where does, where does um, Sam Harris find purpose and meaning? I, I saw an interview he just did with trigonometry. I, I saw a section of it, him and Eric Weinstein. And he says, yeah, it's really sad that uh, people can't find purpose and meaning where it really is. Where is purpose and meaning, according to Sam Harris? In a psychedelic experience. I mean, he says, if only once psychedelics become more common, once psychedelics becomes more acceptable, then people will discover a purpose and meaning in them. <laughs> in a, a, a state of consciousness elicited by drugs. A state of consciousness detached from actual reality in a state of consciousness where one is not in control of one's own mind. That's where you will find purpose. That's where you will find meaning. This is Sam Harris. This is the advocate for reason. This is the secularist. This is the atheist. And I like Sam Harris. I like a lot of his stuff. But that is insanity. So if purpose and meaning have to be found in a mystical experience, I don't need to take drugs. I can just believe in God and meditate to God. Yeah, I think, I think it just as an aside, I think Sam Harris is one of the best cultural commentators out there by, by far, by far. There are very few better than him. Uh, his analysis of... Uh, of uh, so many issues. Yes, I know he denies free will. They all deny free will. Who exactly upholds free will? Stephen Pinker denies free will in, in some respect. He also is defending free will right now. They all deny it in some sense. And yet, he is still the best commentator, or among the best commentators on current events. He was excellent on Trump. He's been excellent on woke. He's been excellent on free speech. He's been excellent on, uh, I don't know, even on gun laws. He's really, really good. But his advocacy for psychedelics as the source of meaning and purpose of life is nuts. Nuts. Yes, David Deutsch promotes free will, one of the few intellectuals out there who does that. Good for him. I'm a big, I'm a fan, right? Up to a point. <laughs> So 
Sam is terrible on a number of things. Yes, I know. But he's great when he's great. And if you can't see that, I can't help you. So the idea here is that meaning and purpose have to be outside. And meaning and purpose are the exclusive realm of religion and psychedelics, I guess. But what about the idea, the meaning and purpose are in our lives, or choices we make, or what we decide, how we decide to shape our life, our material life, and our spiritual life? What about the purpose of living a good life, living a moral life, elevating your life to the best you can be? to living the best that you can be, to being a moral person. Morality, as Ayn Rand conceives it, not as these Christians conceive of it. Shouldn't that be the purpose of life, living? Being the best at living you can be? Why does the purpose of life entail something outside of you and therefore always entails sacrifice of your own values, sacrifice of who you are, sacrifice of your independence, sacrifice of your own mind? She goes on to write, Russell and other activist atheists believe that with the rejection of God, we would enter an age of reason and intelligent humanism. We should. But Russell, of course, is an enemy of reason, properly understood. But the God hole, the void left by the retreat of the church, has merely been filled by a jumble of irrational quasi-religious dogma. All true. Does that mean it cannot be filled by reason and rationality? It cannot be filled by rational values and the pursuit of rational values and a rational life? The result is a world where modern cults prey on the dislocated masses, offering them spurious reasons for being in action, mostly by engaging in virtue signaling theater on behalf of a victimized minority or our supposedly doomed planet. The line often attributed to G.C. Chesterton has turned into a prophecy. Quote, when men choose not to believe in God, they do not therefore believe in nothing. They then become ca capable of believing in anything. But that is such a narrow view of the world. Is everybody doing that? Is everybody who is a secularist engaged in virtue signaling theater? Is everybody joining modern cults? It's true many people are. It's true it is a real problem. But is the solution at an ancient cult instead of a modern cult? And isn't part of the reason that this virtue signaling on behalf of a victimized minority isn't, and, and do planet, isn't that partially because of the altruism that Christianity teaches us? The original sin that Christianity teaches us? Do we have to believe in nothing? Or can we believe in rational values? In this nihilistic vacuum, she continues, the challenge before us becomes civilizational. We can't withstand China, Russia, and Iran. She goes back to this. If we can't explain to our population why it matters that we do, yes, I agree with that. We can't fight woke ideology if we can't defend the civilization that it is trying to destroy. Yes, what is that civilization, Ayn Hirsi Ali? You have to think about what that civilization really is. It's not the Judeo-Christian tradition. And we count counter Islamism with purely secular tools. Yes, we can. And how? It's the only way to counter it. To win the hearts and minds of Muslims here in the West, we have to offer them something more than videos on TikTok. True. But why are videos on TikTok the symbol of a secular country? They're not. The symbol of hedonism and nihilism, the sim symbols of emptiness, and most of the people on TikTok would probably say they believe in God and probably say they were part of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Indeed, most woke people, here's something I would guarantee to you, most woke people are religious or at least believe in God. 
and think of themselves as part of that Judeo-Christian tradition. It's only through reason. It's only through rational values. It's only through valuing your own life and understanding what value your own life requires, demands of you, that you can actually, A, live a happy life, and B, challenge all the enemies that we face. She says, the lesson I learned from my years with the Muslim Brotherhood was the power of a unifying story, absolutely. Embedded in the foundational text of Islam to attract, engage, and mobilize Muslim masses. Unless we offer something as meaningful, I fear the erosion of our civilization will continue. And fortunately, there's no need to look for some new age concussion and medication and mindfulness. That, that's, uh, I think that's an attack on, <laughs> on Sam Harris. Christianity has it all. Yeah, except liberty, except freedom, except dignity, except truth. By the way, nowhere in the entire essay does she claim Christianity is true. Nowhere in the entire essay does she say she's come to the conclusion that God is real. She can't find purpose, so she needs somebody to give her purpose. She can't fight Islam, so she's looking for another tribe to join to be able to fight Islam. And I'm being ungenerous here on purpose. I really do respect Ayn Hirsi Ali, so this is, this is why it's so shocking and upsetting. So she says, that is why I no longer consider myself a Muslim apostate, but a lapsed atheist. Of course, I will have a great deal to learn about Christianity. I discover a little more at church every, each Sunday, but I have recognized in my own long journey through a wilderness of fear and self-doubt that there is a better way to manage the challenges of existence than either Islam or unbelief have to offer. There you have it, guys. Um, this is what the world is coming to. And, and, and this is what you should fear. You should really, really fear.